Hi, AP Seminar students. Um, thank you for tuning in for today's video. Uh, we're going to be discussing the four types of evidence that we're going to be seeing frequently, both as we read arguments and look for maybe some gaps in their use of evidence, but then also as we do research and produce our own arguments, we want to rely on these different types of evidence and we want to know what makes them strong and what makes them weak? When could they be used to strengthen my argument? And also, how can I detect in others' arguments when they've used ever evidence in a proper way to support their argument? So um, we're going to talk about four main types today. The first type is called anecdotal evidence uh, or storytelling. Uh, the second type is called statistical evidence uh, or data. Sometimes it's call called quantitative uh, data. Uh, the third type is going to be called experimental evidence, and we're going to talk about empirical evidence uh, in relation to that. And then lastly, it's going to be uh, authorities or a testimony as evidence, uh, similar to like a person who is an expert speaking on something as evidence. So um, to go through these different types here, I'll provide some examples and um, I will explain to you uh, strengths and weaknesses here. So anecdotal evidence or storytelling um, can be used to support an idea or an argument in a number of ways. There are benefits to it. Um, there are also many weaknesses to it. Um, so an anecdote is a personal story or a description of something that's happened um, to use as support to uh, prove a point or to prove a claim, right? An example or a situation that can help show an idea or show something, uh, that's also how we can think of an anecdote, right? A story as an example of where we're seeing something. Um, some benefits of this is storytelling and showing real world examples uh, is often memorable, right? It's, it's easy to remember a story of a family who's been impacted in some way. They're illustrative and they're descriptive a lot of times. So they easily appeal to our emotions and make us care. Uh, this type of evidence is often used great to hook your reader in early or at the start of an argument to help show an example or to bring context. Um, can also give us specific insight to trends if we have like a focus group and we are asking them their perspective about something, they, they might be able to tell a story about why they support something or why they don't support something. So there are some benefits to this type of evidence. However, as a whole, a single story doesn't apply to all and can't represent a larger thing unless it's paired with other examples of evidence, right? Oftentimes, if you're just relying on a single story as evidence, uh, it can lead to generalizations or overgeneralizations um, and without being combined with something else, it's going to be viewed as a weak type of evidence. So an example here, right, um, this uh, article from the New York Times um, kind of starts out their idea or their argument about the Middle East with um, an example of a family that had fled Afghanistan. They emotionally appeal to us. It's memorable. It's illustrative. It gets us engaged in their argument. Um, so there's benefits to it. However, as you can see there from my image on the right, um, the anecdotal evidence detective from this uh, political cartoon, right? Relying on a single story can lead to generalizations and can actually lead to um, problematic ways of thinking, right? So you can see there, uh, for example, um, this guy reads one story of a gun owner who shot and killed the criminal or stopped them in the act. That's great, right? That's one example of a person who used a gun for a positive thing, which is to stop uh, a criminal from doing something illegal. However, this person comes to the conclusion, the overgeneralization that more guns make us a safer place, which a lot of data um, conflicts with, right? So that's the problem with a single story or anecdote, and that's why it can be viewed as weak evidence. Uh, my next type of evidence here, and the one that we're going to want to rely on heavily in this class as we look at uh, other people's arguments and also as we produce arguments, is statistical evidence, data, uh, numbers, or sometimes we call this quantitative uh, data. Um, this is when numbers, data, charts, graphs, etc., are used to capture broad trends. Um, and normally, whenever we're collecting data, uh, if it comes from a quality source, it has a high level of objectivity, right? It's able to be measured. There is no subjective view on that. Uh, there is just a single measure for the thing. So normally this evidence is gonna be our strongest form of evidence and what we use to help prove our points, our claims, and to help further our argument throughout the year. Um, however, one thing to be aware of with statistical evidence is it's only as strong as the credibility of the source. Data can be misleading sometimes. Um, people can uh, misrepresent data uh, or they might not measure it in an effective way. 
So like maybe an example here for a way that data could be manipulated. Um, we polled 20 people to ask them their opinion on the best fruit uh, that's out there, just for an example here. And let's say that 17 of the 20 agreed that strawberries uh, are the best type of fruit. Um, statistically, that would mean that uh, above 85% of people would say that strawberries are the best fruit. Now, if we had said that and used that data manipulated, we said 85% of Americans um, from a recent survey conducted say that strawberries are the best type of fruit. There's a problem with that. We've only measured 20 people. How can we conclude that that represents all of the United States? Right? It does not necessarily represent it. So statistics, you have to be careful with. Look at the credibility of the source. Look at the study itself and the amount of people or participants in the study and also examine, could that study be repeated again and find similar results? That's what's gonna solidify our statistical evidence. Our next type of evidence here is called experimental evidence, or uh, sometimes it's called empirical evidence. A lot of times these studies can yield statistics like we just talked about, um, but experimental evidence is evidence that can be experienced or observed by anyone through the scientific method or process. Right? This type of evidence is often really strong if it can be consistently observed over time many different times. Right, Theories eventually become laws or facts, um, but they need to be observed consistently over time for us to support them as or believe that they are strong examples of evidence. Right, So an example here uh, might be like we're trying to measure the temperature outside and we conduct an experiment on it. If all of our tools are the same, if all our experimenters uh, are going out there to measure the temperature and we can repeat that process over and over, we can come to the conclusion that yes, it is indeed 89 degrees outside because we had hundreds of people measure it using a consistent tool, a thermometer, and uh, they all came to a same conclusion that it's 89 degrees, right? The more people that measure and observe the same phenomenon, the more empirical the evidence, the stronger the evidence is. However, if the experiment can't be repeated, if there is flaws in the experiment or flaws in their scientific method uh, as they approach their experiment, these pieces of evidence can also be weak, right? So I think the best thing we can do here is look into the experiment itself, look into the number of participants, make sure that you could replicate or repeat the experiment over again and find similar results. That's how this evidence becomes stronger over time. An example here, uh, Isaac Newton, right? Um, the guy who, uh, you know, came up with a lot of the laws of motion uh, and the law of gravity. It didn't start as a law. It was a theory. He had a theory about what this phenomenon was that he was observing when the apple fell. But over time, consistent empirical uh, evidence or measurements of this happening over and over and over again allowed us to form the law of gravity, right? It became a law because it was more empirical over time. Okay. Our uh, next piece of evidence here and the last one we're going to talk about today in this video um, are authorities as evidence or testimonial evidence. Uh, sometimes we can think of this similar to an expert giving us support or, or giving us their perspective and that being used as evidence, right? This is when a person who's an authority figure has expertise in a topic, uh, speaks on behalf of that topic, and then their ideas or their viewpoint is used for support. Um, this is great whenever the person has a high level of expertise. This is excellent forms of evidence if we're coming from someone who's an expert in the field or has the ability to observe that information that they are reporting on. But we also have to be careful with this. We have to think, is this person an expert in the field? What makes them an expert in that field? And do they have relevant expertise to speak on what they're speaking on? If you can say yes to all those things, authorities and testimonials as evidence is often viewed as strong evidence because these people are experts in what they're speaking on. However, people do make mistakes sometimes, so we have to put that into the negatives category for this type of evidence. Maybe they mo made a mistake in the past and we don't want to um, cite their mistakes, right? We want to cite their accurate testimonial. Also, another thing to consider here is, do they have a vested interest in some way? Might they have a reason to try to lie or tell the truth or influence us to support or believe something that's outside of their realm of expertise? So an example here is dentists, right? Um, maybe Colgate is trying to get 
that eight out of 10 dentists thing for their commercial. Uh, eight out of 10 dentists agree that Colgate is the uh, best type of toothpaste, right? Those dentists probably believe that all toothpaste and flossing and brushing is a positive thing. They might be getting some sort of financial incentive or benefit from Colgate, right? A vested interest to try to uh, report on this and speak a testimonial in a positive light of uh, Colgate. So authorities as evidence or testimonial evidence is great if it's a high level of expertise in the topic, if they're not trying to convince us they have no vested interest and they haven't really made mistakes or errors in what they are speaking on or researching, uh, authorities as evidence can be really, really strong um, in support. Okay, that is all I have for us for our different types of evidence. I hope you enjoyed the video um, and reach out if you have any questions.